Welcome students to the last chapter of insurance law. In fact, we are going to deal with three chapters. I consolidated the chapters and tried to simplify it and you know uh, encapsulate it in the best possible manner. Just to remind you what we learned during the last class, just to set the perspective. The last class we spoke about insurance contracts being a, being a special kind of contracts. We spoke that we spoke of insurance contracts being indemnity contracts. We said that in case of life insurance policy, indemnity clause does not find its place in a life insurance policy contract. We discussed also about insurance laws in the international perspective. We learned about the laws in UAE, that is the United Arab Emirates. We learned about the laws in the Sultanate of Oman. We learned about the laws in Spain in the UK and so on. Uh, I'm sure it was interesting to learn about different laws pertaining to insurance in different parts of the world. However, you have learned last class that the basic idea and the basic principles are the same. However, the legislations may be different and it may only, be, it may only vary to a certain extent in certain areas from one state to another, say example in the USA, in the United States of America, from one state to another, or from one country to another. However, generally speaking, insurance contracts, you know, they are indemnity contracts, except life insurance contracts, where they compensate for the loss that has occurred to the insured. Today, we're going to move further and learn about measure of insurance and the, the waiver principle, the doctrine of promissory estoppel, how it is applied to insurance contracts, and a very interesting concept in the field of insurance that is reinsurance. Just give me a second. Now, insurance waiver. What is waiver? The, the simple meaning of waiver is to, you know, give up a particular right and not be assertive about that right when the person gives up the particular right or to, or, or even it could be just to waive off a particular right. For example, in insurance, they talk about waiver of premium or waiver of the right to even procure insurance. And then we'll talk about the doctrine of estoppel, which is the same principle which, which we studied under the law of contracts. Now, how it is applicable to insurance contracts, again, we just would you know, try to apply the doctrine of estoppel to the insurance contracts. These are simple, uh, you know, uh, uh, simple terms and uh, the expressions are just that the normal uh, meanings of waiver and estoppel in law would be actually applied even to the insurance policy contract. Now, what is insurance waiver? Having understood that waiver normally means just relinquishing rights or giving up rights pertaining to something. Now, Investopedia has defined waiver as a legally binding provision where either party in a contract agrees to voluntarily forfeit a claim or give up a claim without the other party being liable. Now, thereby, the you know, waiver is a voluntary relinquishment where a person on his or her own gives up the right under a valid insurance policy. Now, why are we talking about the validity of insurance policy because the question of giving up a right would come when the rights exist and rights for it to exist should be part of a you know a valid contract be it insurance contract or any other contract so i'm sure you have learned in the law of contract that there are certain elements that need to be present for in in a contract for a law for a contract to be considered as valid 
For example, it must have, you know, an offer, a valid offer, a valid acceptance, which would constitute an agreement. And that agreement should be legally enforceable. And the factors that revolve on the legal around legal enforceability is consideration and you know valid consent that is consent that is without duress or coercion or there shouldn't be any misrepresentation and so on likewise the same principles are applicable even in special contracts like insurance contracts and even in insurance contracts in, in case it's a question of waiver those that waiver pertains to certain relinquishment of rights which are legitimate rights and we always talk about legitimate rights and which may be incorporated or are a part of, maybe it is an express right or an implied right, which should, be, which should find its place in a valid insurance contract. So validity is also in terms of the, the, the subsistence of the contract or during the subsistence of the contract, that is the term of the contract. Now, thereby, a waiver of insurance premium by the insurance company uh, is also, it could also be, you know, it forms a part of insurance waiver where the, you know, the insurance company may waive that particular clause and allow the insured to not pay the premium or would permit the insured to, you know, to, you know, abstain from paying the, that regular premium on reasonable grounds in the sense he the, for example the the insured may be sick or he may be disabled so when the insured produces a, a you know a relevant and authenticate uh, health report or a medical report to that effect the insurance company under a waiver policy a relevant waiver policy and or a relevant waiver clause, which may be a part of the insurance contract, or this waiver agreement or a clause could be a part of a rider or an addendum that is attached to the insurance con the in insurance policy contract. So, like so, accordingly, the insurance company may waive off the duty of the the insurer to pay premiums. So as the slide says, there can be a waiver of insurance premium by the insurance company where the insurance company may ask the insured to pay a substantial sum against, as against a long-term permanent or a permanent insurance policy and waive the need of paying the periodical premium. Thereby, the cost of the premium will be incorporated into the total cost of the policy. Now, how would they waive the premium? So naturally, we all know that insurance companies also would want to make a profit. So what would be the profit for them in case there is no premium at all? So what they would do is, depending upon the type of the policy and the terms and the, you know, the, the terms and conditions of a particular insurance policy and the facts and circumstances of the particular uh, you know, insured from case to case basis, it depends, and how also the insurance policy contract is constructed or framed. So what they would do here is there is a possibility that they would, uh, you know, ask the insured in simple terms, they would ask the insured to, you know, pay the amount of premium in advance so as to or they would give a consolidated uh you know premium and say that just pay us once and for all uh, probably during the beginning of the contract and or sometimes it might, might happen that in case there is an application saying that we want a waiver of premium they would say okay you pay us a particular sum of amount as premium and you would be exempted from paying the the uh, from uh, paying periodical premiums so likewise, it depends upon the arrangement, depending upon the type of insurance policy it is and the facts and circumstances of each case. So we were talk we are talking about waiver of premium when it comes to you know insurance policies. 
but it also happened that the insured may apply for a waiver on reasonable grounds, such as prolonged sickness, as I said earlier, disability, etc., for which the proof of such a disability or medical certificate must be provided to the insurance company. Thus, a waiver of premium is a type of add-on cover and also is called as a rider, a rider in the form of an appendage to the, the original insurance policy contract. And in the above context, a waiver clause will be reflected in an insurance policy or in an additional appendage or an extra as a rider to the contract that will relieve the policyholder or insured of the obligation to pay further premiums under each circumstance. For example, again, reiterating sickness of the life insurance policyholder or redundancy where the person has lost the job due to redundancy. If the policy permits waiver uh, under such condition of re redundancy, it depends again, uh, depending upon the policy of uh, a particular insurance company, etc. So the waiver of the premium may be for a short duration until the person springs back to normal in case of redundancy, etc. if it is a long term. Now, declining a mandatory insurance policy cover by an individual who is entitled to an insurance policy would also amount to waiver of an additional insurance policy. For example, we have B, who is A's wife. Okay, so this is, you know, uh, the, uh, I mean, uh, the next context of waiver uh, in, in, you know, in, in, under insurance law. So one was waiver of premium. Now this is waiver of procuring policy. Like for example, there is a lady, B, she is A's wife. She's offered health insurance policy by A's company, that is a husband's company. Now, A can decline it on the ground that B is already offered a health insurance plan by her own employer. Now, instead of having two health policies and similar health policies, similar coverage, you know, B can, through A, of course, decline the insurance policy that is provided for the family of A by the company of A. So in such a case, B will be asked to sign a waiver form to be submitted to the insurance company through A's employer. So a waiver is thereby, you know, it is an intentional or a voluntary act and being fully aware of the consequence of such waiver. So waiver in, in terms of insurance could be waiver of insurance premium one, and two, waiver of procuring an additional insurance policy. So a waiver, of course, can be expressed. You know, it could uh, it, it would find its place in the contract or a rider and so on, or it could be implied that is it understood. The example of an implied waiver is that the insurer has been continually accepting delay payments. This is again another example in another context. Now we are talking about uh, the the insurer that is the insurance company. Now, say for example, there is a particular insured or the policy holder who is into the habit of delayed payments for whatever reason, so salary is coming late or whatever reason. So, in case of delayed payments uh, of insurance premium. Uh, you know, normally the insurance company would send reminders and there would be a particular policy that needs to be, uh, you know, uh, abided by. However, say the insurance company, you know, they permit the insured to, you know, to pay delayed premiums and they accept the premiums whenever they, it is paid. And say, after some time, they say that, now we rescind the contract with you, we terminate with you because, you have paid us delayed premiums. Now, at this point, the insurance company will be stopped in law, that is, they would be stopped. They would not be allowed. So this is where even the, the doctor of Estopo would see them here, but we'll not go into that so soon. But I'm just saying that the, you know, at, at this juncture, the insurance company by law would be stopped by the virtue of the historical principle as well that, you know, tries to enter this uh, example and they would be stopped from, uh, you know, uh, from, uh, from uh, negating the rights of the insured and from terminating the insurance policy on the ground of, you know, non-payment of premium or even delayed premiums. 
Now, the reason being that the insurance uh, company or the insurer has been into the habit of accepting delayed premiums and has not mentioned any time uh, you know, anything you know, all the while. So here, now the insurance company, uh, you know, you know, cannot or basically, uh, you know, has waived its right through its actions that is implied through its action of accepting delayed premiums that it is comfortable with the delayed premiums and thereby it cannot be a cause for termination of or, you know, rescinding the insurance contract. So, however, in case though they have been receiving delayed premiums in case there was a valid intimation or a notice to that effect of its of its intention that it's not comfortable in simple terms or in lay language that it's it, it, it it's not comfortable from with receiving delayed uh, premiums and it's against the policy or it goes against the the clause uh, clauses or the terms in the insurance policy contract and of course, negating uh, the so of course uh, the insurance uh, the insurance company or the insurer would be committed to you know to you know rescind the contract. But in case of an absence of intimation or notice, and you know regularly accepting delayed payments, that means it can be an implied waiver of its right of not terminating the contract, and it would be uh, like you know it has approved the, the, the system of delayed payments. So this is an example for you, even for waiver, as well as for promissory estoppel, or even just the, the principle, the doctrine of estoppel, where the insurance company or the insurer is stopped, is stopped from rescinding the contract because of the implied agreement, which is the scene in this example of, uh, you know, of continuing with the contract and accepting delayed payments. Now, what is this doctrine of estoppel? It is the same doctrine as you have studied in the law of contract. But the doctrine of estoppel, as you already know, forbids retracting or going back from a promise made or a position or a claim, especially when the promise when the promise e acts upon the promise statement to his detriment. So here there are three factors that needs to be noted. One is, you know, there has been a promise made or there is you know, uh, a kind of a transaction that is that can be easily presumed there is an offer or a promise made, okay, or there is a position that is, you know, kind of either expressed or impliedly, uh, which you can really, uh, you know, presume the mind of the promiser. So, you know, there is a promise, basically, or there is and a valid inference can be drawn that a particular transaction is, is going to take place. And depending upon that particular inference or a promise, or which can be an express or an implied promise, the promise who is there, the other party at the other end, acts upon that transaction to his detriment or which might cause loss to the other party who acts upon this particular promise. So, the doctrine of estoppel, just like other contracts or insurance or you know, other contracts, even an insurance contract, is a defense mechanism or a defense tool in which the courts stop a person from moving backward or retracting from his word or a promise. Now, on the principle of you know uh, a promissory estoppel in contracts. Uh, no, we have the two basic cases. One is, of course, uh, comb versus comb, and the the you know in comb versus comb, there was Justice Denning who observed that the doctrine of promissory estoppel works on the principle of equity. However, in a contract, it should not be allowed to displace the principle of consideration, where consideration is a valid element for the legal enforceability of a contract, for a contract to be considered as valid. So this was in Combe versus 
Cool. So in insurance contracts, the insurer is not permitted from retracting from his covenanted obligation. Of course, Combe versus Combe is not an insurance uh, case. It is a, a case, the facts of the case is something different, but uh, I've just chosen this case because it explains the doctrinal principle. And there was a very interesting uh, observation made by Justice Denning, where he says that, the, the you know, of course, the promissory estoppel, I mean, it's good because it works in the principle of equity. However, when it comes to contracts, the, the, the element of consideration should not be displaced. So if applying this principle of insurance contract, now here the insurer is not permitted from retracting from his covenanted obligations and that the insured has all reason to believe that the insurer would comply with the contractual obligations that has and has relied on the assurance, has acted upon the contract to his or her detriment, thereby shunning from the commitment by the insurance uh, company or the insurer is unacceptable at this juncture and would be construed and as, as an act that uh, you know, uh, the act that, uh, you know, is not uh, is is not permitted by law and the, the principle of estoppel would uh, really, you know, uh, operate in this case, or in, in this kind, in this uh, example. So in Middlesex Mutual Insurance Company versus Levine, Uh, the court upheld, sub, uh, upheld and substantiated the principle of promissory estoppel and maintained that for relying on the doctrine of promissory estoppel in insurance contracts, the insured must have relied upon the representation to his or her detriment. So in Middlesex Mutual Insurance Company versus Levine, the court applied the, the, the principle or the doctrine of promissory estoppel to insurance contracts as well and said that and maintained that for relying on the doctrine of promissory estoppel in insurance contracts, the insured must have relied upon the representation to his